Hello again. In my previous video, I discussed how to suspect acute HIV infection. Now, once these acute symptoms of HIV subside, the infection will enter its chronic phase, which will last for years. It can be anywhere between two to let's say 10 years. But the point is, over this time, the virus will gradually destroy the patient's immune system, mainly by destroying the CD4 lymphocytes. Now, a normal CD4 lymphocyte count in a healthy individual is anywhere between 700 to let's say 1500 cells per cubic millimeter and the trouble is that over this time this chronic stage of infection there aren't that many symptoms that will alert you to the fact that your patient is actually infected that is until the virus manages to reduce the number of cd4 lymphocytes to let's say 200 cells per cubic millimeter as it approaches this threshold of 200 opportunistic infections and malignancies become increasingly common and this third stage of illness once this happens once opportunistic infections start to appear is called aids acquired immunodeficiency syndrome so by this point the patient is severely immunocompromised and we know what kind of infections and what kind of malignancies we can expect. But if you look them up, if you Google AIDS-defining conditions, you will end up with something that looks like this. About 20 weird sounding diagnoses that really don't mean that much to you unless you happen to be an HIV specialist. So let's reduce it to the symptoms and signs that you can actually see in a patient. And from my experience, the best way to do this is to divide these symptoms by organ systems. So let's start with the first organ, the lungs. The most common manifestation of AIDS in industrialized countries is pneumocystis pneumonia. Now pneumocystis is a fungus and your patient with pneumocystis pneumonia will usually present with protracted low-grade fever that lasts for weeks and progressive dry cough and progressive dyspnea. So this worsening dyspnea over the course of several weeks is especially significant for pneumocystis pneumonia. By the time they come to see you, most patients will have a hard time even walking. This is how severe their respiratory failure will be. Many of them will already have abnormal O2 sets when they are at rest. So this is typical for pneumocystis. But when you auscultate them, usually you won't hear anything that impressive. But once you take a look at the x-ray, now this should be quite impressive. You will see typically bilateral diffuse interstitial infiltrates more pronounced in the lower portions of the lungs. Now, when I say it like that, I know it sounds kind of like COVID-19, but there are many clinical and radiological differences between pneumocystis and COVID. Now, mainly this protracted course that lasts for weeks, this is typical for pneumocystis. And on top of that, in pneumocystis, there are no upper respiratory tract symptoms. So there is no sneezing, uh, runny nose, sore throat or something like that. And of course, your COVID test will be negative. So remember this protracted course, bilateral infiltrates, progressive dyspnea. You should suspect that this is something unusual, that this is not your garden variety community acquired pneumonia. You will consider all sorts of conditions, but please remember that you have to include pneumocystis pneumonia in your differential diagnosis as well. Now, a hundred years ago, if you mentioned protracted low-grade fever, night sweats, dry cough, progressive dyspnea, weight loss, I guarantee no one would think of pneumocystis pneumonia because there was no pneumocystis pneumonia back then, there was no AIDS back then. What everyone would think of would be tuberculosis, of course. Now, of course, tuberculosis is not as common as it used to be a hundred years ago, but it's still not gone. Please remember that. You will see patients with tuberculosis from time to time, and it's especially common in patients who are immunodeficient, not to mention HIV infected patients, patients with AIDS. And in addition to mycobacterium tuberculosis, there are also other mycobacteria that can affect the lungs and the lymph nodes in the lungs. So remember, mycobacteria just love to infect the lymph nodes. So if, if you see impressive enlarged lymph nodes on x-ray, you should at least consider mycobacterial infections. And if you do that, you will consider HIV as well. But let's not forget that in addition to infections, enlarged lymph nodes can be a consequence of 
malignancy. So both solid and hematologic malignancy and malignant tumors are more common in immunodeficient patients, especially patients with AIDS. So if you see impressive enlarged hyalur lymph nodes on x-ray, you will suspect at least these two groups of conditions, infections, primarily mycobacterial infections and malignancies. But let's go back to pneumonia per se. Besides pneumocystis and mycobacterium tuberculosis and other mycobacteria, there are also other potential causes of pneumonia in AIDS patients like cryptococcus and other fungus, viruses like herpes viruses. Once again, many of these patients will present with protracted pneumonia, protracted fever, progressive dyspnea, weird bilateral infiltrates, poor response to our usual standard antibiotics. All of this should make you suspect that you're dealing with something out of the ordinary. But even with normal, let's say, usual pathogens, usual causes of pneumonia like streptococcus pneumonia, the most common cause of bacterial community acquired pneumonia, even then, if you see bacterial pneumonia that is especially severe, in a patient who doesn't have any obvious risk factors for severe pneumonia, it's time to stop and think, why did this happen to this patient? And especially if it's recurring. So if your patient had two or more episodes of bacterial pneumonia in a single year, you have to suspect that there is a predisposing condition. Now, if you're dealing with a patient who is, let's say, over 50 and a smoker, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is some sort of tumor, right? Lung cancer. But if you see a younger person with no obvious risk factors, with recurrent pneumonia, HIV is on top of your list of potential predisposing conditions. So much about pneumonia. Let's move to another important organ. I mean, it doesn't get any more important than this, the brain. Now, if you do a head CT scan or an MRI for whatever reason, and you find a focal lesion, something that looks like an abscess or a cyst or a tumor, usually you won't know what that is right away. So you will plan for a broad diagnostic workup. Just please don't forget to include HIV testing. Simple as that. I'm emphasizing this because many clinicians miss that and it really does matter because again, many intracranial infections and tumors are way more common in HIV infected patients, especially in patients with AIDS. If you see a focal lesion and especially multiple focal lesions, these could be abscesses, this could be cerebral toxoplasmosis, a hugely important AIDS defining condition. This could be lymphoma. There are all kinds of lymphoma that love to metastasize into the central nervous system, but primary central nervous system lymphoma just screams AIDS. So yes, focal lesions, you should at least consider HIV testing, but that's not all. Regarding the brain, let's take a look at the most common neurologic emergency out there, ischemic stroke. Now, most patients with ischemic stroke will be in their 60s or older. They will have at least one predisposing condition in addition to their age, like smoking or hypertension, diabetes, something like that. Now, of course, exceptions do happen. You will see Unfortunately, you will see patients in their 40s or even 30s with ischemic stroke. But when that happens, when you see a relatively young person with no obvious risk factors, you have to stop and think, why would this happen to this person? And if you stop for a moment and ask yourself this question, you will think of potential HIV infection, right? This matters because many infections that are common in chronic HIV and especially AIDS, can affect intracranial blood vessels, they can cause vasculitis. And when there is inflammation, when there is vasculitis, there is an increased probability of thrombosis, thrombogenesis, and thrombosis equals blockage, equals ischemia, right? On top of that, chronic HIV infection in itself is a chronic pro-inflammatory state and inflammation is just great for thrombogenesis. It's a risk factor for arterial occlusion. So once again, you see, if you see a patient with a stroke, with ischemic stroke and no obvious risk factors, you have to at least consider HIV infection. And finally, the virus itself, HIV, affects the brain in acute stages. It can cause 
meningitis that can cause encephalitis even with an altered level of consciousness with delirium right in more advanced stages as well not to mention that op it opens up the gateway for all sorts of infections so if you have a patient with suspected encephalitis or even bacterial meningitis, you cannot go wrong by testing them for HIV. This is such a crucial piece of information because it opens so many possibilities that you wouldn't even consider in an immunocompetent patient. Cerebral toxoplasmosis, PML or uh, primary uh, CNS lymphoma or cryptococcal meningoencephalitis. All these conditions are typical for patients with AIDS but extremely uncommon in patients who are immunocompetent. So in conclusion, any patient with an unexplained focal lesion in the central nervous system or with a central nervous system infection or with an ischemic stroke but no obvious risk factors, you cannot go wrong by testing them for HIV as well. Okay, so now that we've covered the brain and the lungs, let's move to something that we can see right away, the skin. So let's start with the disease everyone knows about and that is herpes. Now many people have cold sores from time to time. This is usually caused by herpes simplex virus 1 and it appears on and around the lips. It manifests with this small patch of inflamed skin with small blisters on top and basically it goes away after a week or so with or without treatment. But if herpes persists for weeks or even months or if it affects a huge area of the skin, if it affects the mucous membranes as well, this is not normal. This could be a sign of impaired cellular immunity and if you think about that, you have to think of potential HIV and AIDS as well. Now, a nasty herpetic rash can appear pretty much anywhere on the body and it doesn't have to be herpes simplex. I'm sure you've heard of shingles. Shingles or herpes zoster, this is the result of the reactivation of the chickenpox virus and it can affect way larger areas of the skin but usually within one or two dermatomes. So it presents with a relatively big area of inflamed painful skin with blisters that are usually more impressive, larger than ones you find in herpes simplex and it's quite common in persons over the age of 60 and the incidence only increases with age. But if you see a person under let's say 50 with shingles, you should suspect potential HIV infection. Now just to be clear, shingles is not an AIDS defining condition. Most of these patients will not have HIV. Nevertheless, shingles in a patient under 50 is kind of weird and in this lecture when I say weird, this means potential HIV. And since we are talking about herpes, don't forget genital herpes. Again, this is not an AIDS defining condition, but genital herpes facilitates the transmission of HIV. It's transmitted in the same way. So whenever you have a patient with an STD, it's prudent to test them for HIV as well. In conclusion, oral herpes that persists for weeks or months or it affects a larger area of the skin, shingles in a patient under 50 and genital herpes, these are all indications for HIV testing. Now there are also rashes that are not AIDS defining conditions but they are more common in people with HIV. The perfect example is seborrheic dermatitis. The vast majority of people with seborrheic dermatitis do not have HIV. All I'm saying is that, that this rash is more common in HIV infected patients than in the general population. But the lesion that is an AIDS defining condition is Kaposi sarcoma. On the skin you will usually find more than one of these lesions. They look like brownish or purple huge moles. By huge I mean several centimeters in length. They form by excessive growth of small blood vessels and this is a very common condition in AIDS. You remember Tom Hanks's character from Philadelphia, right? He was depicted as having multiple lesions on his head and on his torso. So again malignancy is very common in AIDS. And the one thing I would like you to remember about Kaposi is that it's not necessarily limited to the skin. It can affect mucous membranes as well. It can extend into the esophagus, into the trachea, in the internal organs. So 
take a look at the mucous membranes as well, especially the oral cavity. And in that case, look for other typical lesions that can be found in AIDS, like white patches that can be sign of yeast infection, so candida, right oral thrush, or this could even potentially be oral hairy leukoplakia. And remember that the oral cavity, the epithelium, continues into the pharynx, and then the pharynx continues into the esophagus and the trachea, of course. So, all of these lesions, Kaposi sarcoma, candidiasis, herpes, they can extend to the esophagus and the trachea as well. Now, naturally, you won't be able to see them in there right away. You need specialized equipment, but you need to be able to suspect that they are there. So, if you see a patient who is complaining of painful swallowing, especially if there is weight loss, so if, if the pain is so severe that there is a reduced oral intake that your patient is actually losing weight, you will plan for endoscopy and then you or another medical professional will visualize these lesions in the esophagus as well. Which leads me to another point, weight loss, wasting, chronic diarrhea, chronic gastrointestinal symptoms. This is very common in patients with chronic HIV and especially AIDS. And many times this will be the first thing that you notice. And before we wrap this up, just remember, if you happen to stumble upon any of the things that I mentioned in this video, simply make an effort to find more. Because chances are, if your patient really does have AIDS, you will find more than one element to support this diagnosis. So, if the patient presents with weird protracted pneumonia or a weird neurologic condition, take a look at their lymph nodes in all regions. Check their skin. Look for big purple moles. Look for herpetiform rashes or for seborrheic dermatitis. Take a close look at their oral cavity. Look for white patches. Ask them about weight loss, about chronic diarrhea, about recurring infections and STDs. So nothing fancy, just good quality medical history and physical examination. And if you would like to see more of these videos, please let me know by liking this and subscribing. And more importantly, please share these videos with your colleagues and students. I really think that this will help them in practice. And that is what this is all about. Thank you for watching. Good luck and take care.